Howard Thurman writes what I consider a very scary meditation. It raises the question, are you a reservoir, a canal, or a swamp? Maybe you've heard this before. If you have, it's good to hear it again. He writes, the function of a canal is to channel water. It is a device by which water may move from one place to another in an orderly and direct manner. It holds water in a temporary sense only because it holds it to transit from one point to another. The function of a reservoir is to contain water, to hold water. However, its place is to hold water and store it in order that it may be available when it is needed. A swamp differs from both. A swamp has an inlet but no outlet. Water flows into it, but there's no provision for the water to flow out of it. The result? The water rots and many living things die in it. Often there is a strange, death-like odor that pervades the atmosphere. The water is alive, but it is apt to be rotten. There is life in a swamp, but it's dead. The dominant trend, Howard Thurman writes, of a person's life may take on the characteristics of a canal, reservoir, or swamp. The important accent is on the dominant trend. There are some lives that seem ever to be channels, canals, through which all things flow. They are connecting links between other people, movements, and purposes. They make the network by which all kinds of communications are possible. They seem to be adept and related. Or are you a reservoir? Are you a resource by which others may be drawn upon in times of need? Have you developed a method for keeping an inlet and an outlet? Amen? In good working order, so that the cup which you give is never empty when called upon. As a reservoir, you are a trustee of all of the gifts God has shared with you. Or, are you a swamp? Are you always reaching for more and more and hoarding whatever comes your way and your special belongings? If so, do you wonder why you are friendless? Why things around you seem to decay and die? A swamp is a place where living things often sicken and die. The water has no outlet. He writes, Canal, reservoir, or swamp? Which one are we? That's a scary one for me, brothers and sisters. I have to check my inlets and my outflows <laughs> and make sure that whatever I'm garnering, whether it's my name or my degrees or my status or my whatever, my years of experience, I need to make sure there's an outlet somewhere. And that I'm not just holding that all in and getting all rotten on the inside. And so when I'm getting tired, it's not my physical tiredness, it's my spiritual tiredness because I've let much in and I haven't let some out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, I pray to God I, and I get some swampiness every once in a while. I don't know about you, I, I, I can feel that sometimes. And I know that there's something inside that's just not right that needs to get out. And every once in a while, I don't know about, I need somebody praying for me. And I don't know who got some friends. <coughs> or a spouse. Or a partner. Who you have enough humility to go to and say, will you pray for me? You're not enough to spend out. Y'all can get that going. Will you pray for me? In our staff meeting this week, we, we did that simple thing that people do in devotional ways. We just said, let's pray to the person to our right. 
And we had a joyful and enjoyable time just loving each other in prayer. While we took care of the business of the church, we wanted to make sure we were taking care of the business of our souls, too. Oh, every once in a while, sisters and brothers, you need to do that around the dinner table. You need to do it wherever you're sitting. You need to just grab somebody and say, would you pray for me? Humble yourself and know you don't even have to tell them what you need prayer for. Just assume that God already knows what you need. See, that's what this text says. You see, all the stuff we're worrying about what we need and what we want to have and what our future's going to be, what our building's going to be, what our finances are going to be. God already knows what we need. And here's the good news. I'm getting there faster. I'm not at that point yet. But here's the good news anyway. The scripture that we read says God delights. God's pleasure is giving us the kingdom. God wants us to be free from being possessed and being held back and having the swamp soul in our lives go rotten on the inside so that instead of what you heard earlier about facing life or death, that somehow we get stuck there in the middle and realize that we've got a friend in Jesus who is so good, whose gratefulness to us will help us arrive even upon the darkest death that our past can find. I don't want to be possessed. But I know there's some things that possess me. <laughs> Just bees like that. Whether it's my black kango backwards or whatever. <laughs> but the good news is I know that God yearns for me and yearns for you. Danny Morris has a great book called Discerning God's Will Together. And in it, he begins by saying, what you need to know about our God is what you heard in John 3.17. I love John 3.16, but I live by John 3.17. God sent not only his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world will be saved through him. He starts from there, like he started with the creation, that the creation is good. We don't start bad, we start good. And our attempt to get back to being good comes through Jesus. Yes. But not if we don't want to be rich to God. Not if we find ourselves caught up in the kind of greed that holds us back. There's a story about a dog who was carrying a bone across the bridge. He loved that bone. Big, juicy bone. You know all about this, right? He loved that bone. Went across the bridge and Dr. Manny looked into the water and saw a dog with a bigger bone. <laughs> And he thought about it, and thought about it, and he decided to drop the one in his mouth and go for the one in the water. <laughs> At which time, not only did he lose the bone, but he lost his life. <laughs> we can be the same way sometimes. We think we got something that is so powerful and so important, or we think something better over there on the other side somewhere, and we find out that we lose what we have, including our soul. Because what God has given is right where you are sometimes. There's another story about a young man whose father was quite wealthy. And the young man knew that his father knew he wanted a Jaguar. Did I say that right? Yeah. I don't know if I say that right. Jaguar. Jaguar. And so on his birthday, he went to his father and he knew, his father knew he wanted that Jaguar. <laughs> That's how we say it in Jersey, Jaguar. <laughs> John said, That's all right, come on. Now to talk to the preachers. In the meantime, Young son went to his father, and his father, all ready to get that keys to that Jaguar, 
and his father gave him a Bible. <laughs> the young son took that Bible, he was so mad at his father, he threw it on the floor and left the house and never came back home. Never called the father again. He was so greedy for that car. <laughs> by and by, after a while, Don, I can call you Don, right? He said, I can call you Don. You know she's a Don. <laughs> by and by, after a while, the father died, and the son did finally come to the funeral. After the funeral was over, they went through the things of the father, and yes, it was on the desk. <laughs> that Bible was sitting there. And the son decided, well, maybe I should look in this Bible anyway and look to see where his father had, t had sex in the Bible. And guess what was in the Bible? The keys to the Jaguar. <laughs> he could have had that Jaguar for a long time, but the greed stole his soul and corrupted his heart without realizing that sometimes the very thing we want, God has already provided. We can get possessed by our possessions in a way that we no longer control what's going on. Greed can do a job on us, it can tear up our soul, and we won't know where the wallet of our soul is anymore. Sometimes we invest in people. We think it's over there, so like what well, that person has it, and the reality is God may have it in another whole person, and we look it in the wrong way. Well, here's the story. The story of this whole thing is the best defense is an offense they teach us sometimes. And so if you want to defend against greed, be rich to God. That's what Jesus is saying in the text. If you want to defend against greed, be rich to God. Find a way to love God with all your heart. Find a way to give your arms to the poor. Find a way, I don't know about you, every once in a while, I just have to take the last dollar out. If I see somebody on the street, I don't know what they're going to do with it. But because somehow I heard the scripture say, if somebody asks, you just got to give it once in a while and just trust that God will bless them because I'm not giving for what I want them to do with it. I'm giving because my soul is requiring it. I hope y'all hear me on that. I'm not giving because of what I want to have done with it. I'm giving because God has done something in my soul that makes me give no matter what. Giving is a spiritual matter. It is something that Jesus did with his whole life. More than his money, he gave his blood. There's something about giving that sets us free. I close by saying I hope that when you get to that eighth stage of psychological development of Eric Erickson, the stage that makes you live with integrity or despair, that's what the stage is called. <laughs> when you look back over your life and you say, did I live a life of integrity? And you get to that last moment and you know that life may be coming close sometime at the end, and you can't predict when that's going to be, right? Yeah. At any moment, it's demanded of you. Well, Erickson says somewhere between integrity and despair is where the end of our life will be, and it will be in despair if we start our credit cards in the wrong wallet of our soul. I hope when you look back, whether you're real young or real old, you can get to the end and say, I found a friend in Jesus. Yes. 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 That I have found a way to be grateful no matter what's happening. Yes. That I have found a treasure where no thief can come and steal my joy because it's so deep and so firm in Jesus. No matter who you are and what you do or what you take from me, I got Jesus. Yes. A house not made from hands where nobody can redline you or put you out. A house that you can be assured of, made by the creator of heaven and earth, of all of creation. A house that frees you from all of the possessions. Well, I close with another kind of movie star. Some of you know, I didn't know you were going to be in my sermon this much. That's a spirit thing. Some of you know that the uh, preacher's wife, how many of you know, ever seen a preacher's wife? Yeah. Denzel Washington? 
Y'all saw that? Well, believe it or not, that movie was filmed in Reverend Cherie's church when she was pastoring in New Jersey. Oh, really? And if you look really hard, you will see her face one time <laughs> as an adult. And if you ever come to our home, you'll see a picture of her and Denzel, which I have to turn around because I don't want to be seeing her. Else. But, uh, <laughs> you can talk to her about it. That's for real. It was filmed in uh, Trinity United Methodist Church in Newark, New Jersey. But the only thing I'm going to bring back to you is because when you get down to that last moment, when the whole world <coughs> is shaking you all over the place and you feel the power of Psalm 46 that reminds you that even when the whole earth melts and everything falls around you, Whitney Houston says, when I go to where nobody else can turn, who do I talk to when nobody listens? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation? I go to the rock. Yeah. And I know Kim would sing it, but I'll hold off for a minute. I go to the rock, I know he's able. I go to the rock for my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain and the mountain stands by me. When the earth and all around me is sinking sand, it's on Christ. The solid rock I stand. Yes. When I need a shelter, yes. when I need a friend, yes. I go to the rock. Yes. Amen. 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 Amen and amen. amen. I pray that you break your possessions. Break your possessions by being rich with God. Yes. Find yourself all worried up to stop praying and praising and watch God just float you above the problem. We go to the rock. Let's stand. And if there be those in the church who do not have a church home who would like to have membership in this congregation, you are invited to join us this morning as we sing and invite you to this time together.